Would you follow along with me on the screen or in your Bible as I read from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. This is the word of God for the people of God. Paul writes this. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Good morning, church. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent, which means lots of things, doesn't it? It means that school is out, or should be wrapping up soon. Wrapping up just like the presents that you're putting off. It means that the window for online guaranteed delivery before Christmas Day shopping is shrinking quickly, rapidly. It means that 2023 is right around the corner. 2023 sounds like a sci-fi movie, but here we are living it. And most importantly for us right now, it means that Advent is coming to an end. For those of you who are curious, Christmas itself is technically not part of Advent. And in some calendars, Advent continues all the way through Christmas Eve. But today, however you count it, today is the last Sunday of Advent. It's the day when we light the peace candle and we start to draw this season of anticipation and waiting to a close. Not because everything we've anticipated has come, but because there are other things that we need to attend to as his disciples. We need more than just anticipation and preparation. We need repentance. We need resurrection. We need the indwelling of the spirit, which are all these other things that we celebrate at other times, right? In Lent and at Easter and at Pentecost. The meaning of Advent won't go away because we need it. We need to consider it constantly as we await Jesus' return. Christians are an expectant people, but it is drawing to a time where we need to move on. That said, <clears throat> it's my hope this morning that over the last couple of weeks, you've had a chance to see how all these themes we've discussed kind of bleed into one another, don't they? Hope, faith, joy, and peace. So on the one hand, it's a pretty hard thing to find a category big enough to fit them all. You know, are they doctrinal tenets? Are they descriptions of Jesus? Are they virtues that we aspire to? It's not always clear. But they all seem to hold together somehow. And as I've thought more about that this year, I've come to believe that they're all actually describing the same thing from different angles, a kind of appropriate Christian posture, or better yet, a character profile of the believer. And if it's true, then hope would be the tense of that profile, right? It's the future orientation of the believer, the ever-present expectation that not everything is right now, but we are waiting for it to become made whole. And faith is the relationship kind of at the heart of that profile, that believer. It's the trust, it's the affection, it's the courage. It's those things that motivate us and sustain us while we wait. As I talked two weeks ago, it's an activity of the heart as much as it's an activity of our brains. It's it's all of that. Joy, which we didn't get to inspect as carefully this year, 
is what hope and faith feel like, right? They, they don't feel like fleeting happiness, but they feel like joy. They feel like this unshakable lightheartedness, a lighthearted contentedness, which is strange because to have hope is to be discontent fundamentally. And so to have joy and hope is to have the contentment of being discontent, you might say. Today, we round out that profile by turning to the last Advent theme, which is peace. And my prayer, my, my goal, my aim, is that peace would not just collapse back into these other virtues. That we wouldn't think of peace as joy or as a description of our feelings, but that it would move us into action. I pray that the net result of all this preparation and all this talk and candle lighting would ultimately be obedience and vocation and activity. So that's my goal this morning because I think of all the possible meanings of this word, peace, God is calling us to understand it as a command and as a task, which is something that fills out these other things that we've attended to. So to show you what I mean and hopefully to shine some light on what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I want to think about two big ideas together. Um, or two and a half, two and a half big ideas. First, and very briefly, we need to ask ourselves, what is peace? But that's not where we'll end, because it only is then, I think, that we can turn our attention back to 2 Corinthians 5 and make two big observations. First, something about the work of Christ. We need to consider the work of God in Christ. And then second, we need to consider the ministry of reconciliation. So that's the plan. So let's taxi out on the runway together. We're taking a running start into Paul's letter. And before we, are, before we do that, let's answer this crucial question, what is peace? And that might feel like a really impossibly complex question, but I mean it in a very specific way, not just philosophically or grammatically. I'm not going to read you Webster's definition of peace but strictly speaking, within, the, within our context today, within Advent and within Christmas and within this letter of Paul, what are we getting at when we talk about peace? What are we describing? And I appreciated what Wayne mentioned in his video in the Beacon on Tuesday because he gave us a really helpful answer. He told us that this week's candle is sometimes called the angel candle because of what the angels declared to the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born. Do you remember what they said at the weekday childhood ministry Christmas program this last week? The kindergartners recited all of Luke 2. So I'm not going to ask you to do that because it's been a long time since kindergarten, I know. So let me remind you, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And then Luke tells us that in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Good news, great joy. It will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, and this is what I want us to focus on. This is the point. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those whom he is well pleased. I'm putting all my cards on the table here. I know that there are other passages in scripture that talk about peace. And I admit that if I were to use one of those instead of this one as a point of reference, it would produce a very different sermon in the end. But I'm starting here for a key reason because I think there's a really significant direction that we're given here through the song of these angels. They orient us in a very powerful way. Think about what they sing out together over the fields that night. Glory to God on the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is well pleased. Basically, the peace declared to the shepherds that night is a peace between God and God and people. 
isn't it? In fact, it applies to very specific people. There's a whole world of grammatical controversy around verse 14 because sometimes we quote it saying, peace on earth, goodwill towards men and women, right? But goodwill towards men. But really the words are clunkier than that. Technically, peace is declared only to those in whom God is well pleased. And we could argue that what the angels say earlier about bearing good news of great joy that will be for all people, well, that sounds like a very universal statement. But even then, the point remains really clear in this song. Peace is accomplished for people by virtue of God's favor. It's contingent upon God being pleased. That's how peace is possible. And the reason I want to start there is because the angels, by announcing the good news this way, have also said something really clear about exactly what prevents peace, haven't they? They've kind of diagnosed the problem and giving us the solution, namely that there's disfavor, right? That there's some kind of rift between humanity and God. Or better yet, up until Jesus is born, He has not been well pleased with us. But now somehow in sending us the Messiah, that displeasure has been resolved. So peace, at least the peace of the angels that we are gathering to celebrate today, is very specifically a resolution between God and people that that God has come to view us differently. Though grammatically, peace can mean a host of other things, can it? We often use it to to describe our feelings, to talk about a kind of subjective reality, peace as emotional contentment, which goes on to my point, right, that that peace can collapse back into joy. Both can start to mean essentially that we feel a certain way regardless of our circumstances. And I'm not suggesting that we can't call that stuff peace too. It's just that the peace declared here is different It's actually more of a description of those circumstances than our reaction to them. Or to put it another way, the the peace of the angels is not a declaration about how we feel. It's a declaration about how God feels about us. It happens to us. It doesn't happen in us. And it comes from a change in the rapport of God himself and the way that his Pleasure in us changes our relationship with him fundamentally. So with that very specific niche kind of peace in mind, I think we're now ready for liftoff. So let's take a look at the ending of 2 Corinthians 5, which is probably one of the most important texts in the New Testament. And you're probably like, ah, oh, you say that about all the passages in the New Testament. This, look, at, look that up, because this really is that important. And we need to break it up into two big ideas, as I said before, which requires some some centrifugal force, right? Because in Paul's mind, these things are held together so tightly. But to understand exactly what he's doing, we need to dissect it and examine them closely. So first, we need to look at the word of God, excuse me, the work of God in Christ. And then second, we need to consider the ministry of reconciliation. So, the work of God in Christ. If the angels are right, and I I tend to think that the angels are probably right, and peace is not just a feeling in us, but it's a change in God's disposition, well, then it's worth us asking what needed to happen in order to precipitate such a drastic change, isn't it? Or you could think of it another way, that peace, this peace of good favor, and goodwill. It's like a treaty at the end of a war. And like any other peace treaty, it's hard fought. And in a treaty, there are stipulations about what concessions will be made that actually seek to atone for wrongs, right? That make practical reparations for things that happened in the war. And the same has to be true here. God didn't wake up one morning and decide arbitrarily that He wasn't going to be upset with us anymore. No, the circumstances had to change if our relationship with him was to be repaired. Something had to be done. And our passage gives us two main descriptions of that work. The first is this phrase, in Christ. 
And the second is something that theologians like to talk about as the marvelous exchange. And so I want to look at those just briefly together. So look at verse 19. Paul tells us that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That phrase, in Christ, is one of Paul's trademark expressions, and it's an incredibly valuable one. It means that God was working through Jesus' life and ministry, and even more than that, that he was present in and with Jesus, even as Jesus experienced all of the things that he experienced in the Gospels. Or, to put it even another way, the story of Jesus is the story of God's work in the world. He and God are totally and absolutely identified together, one and the same, which means that it's not the case that Jesus is just a tool that was being used by God to accomplish peace. It's that Jesus is God, and therefore the person and work of Jesus is actually the person and work of God himself. God was in Christ. And back to our point. Jesus' work is the work of reconciliation. That's the word Paul uses here to describe what happened to make this good favor possible. And he uses it in one form or another five times in just six verses. So if peace requires an actual change in circumstances, God achieves that change in Jesus through whom he was reconciling the world to himself. How? Right? Right? How? In the cross. Paul's just spoken about Jesus' death in verse 15. Jesus, who for, their, who for their sake died and was raised, he says. So on the cross, in God's suffering and death for our sake, Paul tells us that God was at work doing something. He was not counting trespasses against us. That's a great definition of reconciliation, isn't it? Essentially, to reconcile is to not count trespasses. But we need to go just a little further because the cross isn't just a divine mood swing. And nor is it just a display of God's empathy for the human condition or an illustration of the extent and depth of God's love for us. It is those things, but it's something so much more in the cross God is making peace possible by actually and practically changing the circumstances of our relationship with him. He can't just choose to not count trespasses because doing so wouldn't change anything. He wouldn't be a good God if he just swept everything under the rug and pretended that sin and death and disobedience just really didn't matter anymore. You know, I goofed. Let's just have a do-over. That your suffering didn't matter. Not only your sin, but the sins committed against you. If you just woke up and said, ah, it's no big deal. That's not how his forgiveness works. No, in the cross, which is already set in motion at Christmas, right? That's, that's, what's, that's what the angels are hoping for. This Messiah is going to do this thing. In the cross, God actually becomes well-pleased with us. Our relationship is made right we're made righteous, to use the more biblical way of talking about that. Not because he convinces himself that we're righteous when we're not. Not by turning some blind eye, but rather like an author of a treaty. God executes justice on the cross. All wrongdoing is repudiated and accounted for. He deals conclusively with all the stuff that's destitute and broken in our world. And he deals with it to the fullest extent possible. He leaves nothing unpunished or unaddressed. And when he's done, he achieves true restitution. And that's what enables him to no longer hold our trespasses against us. It's an actual putting right. The trespasses have been dealt with. It's not... It's not an act. And even more importantly, the trespasses are dealt with via sacrifice. Because God does count our trespasses, to use Paul's words, but he doesn't count them against us. 
He counts them against himself. And he does that in a way that only he can do. He absorbs total responsibility for everything. And if that seems a bit unsatisfying or if that seems unjust or immoral as a resolution to to conflict, well, then we should confess that this kind of responsibility really isn't something that we can take on, is it? Even in our most selfless moments, we can't accomplish both justice and mercy at the same time. We can take the place of the guilty, sure, but if we do, it feels like a mistrial, doesn't it? Like justice hasn't really been served, but God, as our creator, occupies a very different position in the moral landscape of the universe, doesn't he? And remember, like the angel said, all the problems in the world boil down to a fundamental dispute between him as creator and us as creation. At root, he's the one to whom all this wrong stuff has been committed in the first place. And so he's the only one capable of taking it up on the cross in this really radical way. Which Paul then confirms in 2 Corinthians 5 in a really key way. Because he describes it as an act of creation. Did you see that? The work of reconciliation and forgiveness is the work of remaking the world. And what results is new creation. That's how we can... That's how God can balance the books in a way that we can't. But before we move on, it's also worth pointing out the other meaning of that expression, in Christ. Because it's not just God who is in Christ. We're in Christ too. And that's how this work of God actually comes to take effect in us. That's a really valuable, important piece of this puzzle. It's one thing to believe that God was in Christ doing some stuff, right? And that it all applies to him. It's another thing entirely to assert that what happened in Jesus has a bearing on you and me. That it actually changes us. Do you see what I mean? We don't often let ourselves ask that question. But why does the life and death of some first century rabbi have anything to do with our fate or destiny? And this may not answer all of those questions perfectly. But as we read in Paul's letters, it has a lot to do with this idea that we are in Christ. And because of that, his death was also our death. It's what he means in verse 14 when he says, for the love of Christ controls us. Or maybe some of your translations say the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. And therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. There's an inescapable association between us as people and him as our Lord. He is our representative. And by virtue of his incarnation, we are somehow bound up with him and included in him. And the same was true for Adam, right? In Adam's sin, our relationship with God collapses, but in Jesus' obedience, our relationship with God is restored. I think it's exactly what Paul means in Galatians 2.20, which I've quoted several times, even this season. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. I was there. I died when Jesus was on the cross. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The second way that Paul talks about the work of reconciliation has to do with something that I said theologians call the marvelous exchange, sometimes the great exchange or the wonderful exchange. It's just, it's a really good exchange. And it's much simpler, I think, but it's worth pointing out. So in verse 21, he says, for our sake, he, God, made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that transaction happening? Our sin is given to Christ. It's given to Christ to such an extent that Paul uses this hyperbole, that he becomes sin. Jesus becomes sin. And then in exchange, 
we're given the righteousness of God also to such an extent that what happens? That, that we become the righteousness of God. There's a substitution, a trading spaces. Our guilt is removed and given to him, but it doesn't disappear. It's dealt with, like we already talked about. But in its place, we are given the righteousness of God himself and Jesus. We are treated as God treats himself. We are afforded this inter-Trinitarian relationship. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus has also borne our griefs, right? So don't think that this is just a moral game. This isn't just, this isn't just about guilt. It's about all of our griefs, all of what's broken, all of what's dysfunctional and painful. We've given it all to him. And the good news of the gospel is that when we give it, what we're given in return is the righteousness of God. Christ gets our sin, we get his relationship with the Father. That's the marvelous exchange happening here. All right. So, now that we have some idea about the work of God that he's accomplished in Christ on the cross, I think we can turn our attention to our part in this story. Which again, in Paul's mind, is just all one thing. It's all intermingled. But at the end of verse 19, Paul says that God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. And if that was all Paul said, then maybe we could be forgiven for thinking that our role in the story is simply to be heralds of this work that God's accomplished. Go proclaim the peace that he's secured by taking up our guilt and sin and extinguishing it on the cross. And that's true, we should do that. That's a very important part about what it means to be a disciple. It's our greatest commission. But, but Paul doesn't stop there. In verse 18, he tells us that God's given us not just the message of reconciliation. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Which means you and I are not just evangelists. We're not just entrusted with the responsibility of spreading awareness. No, we're also meant to follow Jesus' example and exist in this world as agents of reconciliation, literally as his ambassadors, as Paul puts it there in verse 20. Do you remember what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So just as Jesus has made peace, so too we are to make peace. We're to instantiate peace, the peace that he's made possible, to bring it to fruition, to propagate it through all the ways that we restore broken relationships and set aside conflict. He hasn't just told us to share good news, but he's modeled a way of life for us that reconciles. And then he's entrusted that way of life to us as his people. So how do we do that? What does this ministry mean? of reconciliation look like? Well, look back at verse 16. Paul writes that he and the others he works with, this apostolic cohort that has planted churches all around the Mediterranean, they have chosen not to regard anyone according to the flesh. But that is a really complicated sentence structure, and I want to make sure that we understand what he's he's saying. He says, when he says flesh, he's not actually describing the status of, of the people that he's relating to. He's describing himself. And you can see that clearly in verse 17 when he says that anyone, is in, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. It's, it stands to reason that Paul relates to a lot of people that are not new creations yet, right? But go back to verse 16. When he tells the church in Corinth that he regards no one according to the flesh, he's telling them that his own status as a new creation has changed the way that he relates to everyone. He can no longer regard other people according to his flesh. Because doing so would be to relate to them as if he had not been made new. As if he were still part of the old stuff that is passing away or as if In the words at the end of verse 17, the old had not passed away already. And that's true of us too. Because Jesus has changed us, we can't relate to people as if we were still in the flesh. 
But it doesn't stop there because in verse 16 he reminds us what happens when we do. When we relate to people according to the flesh. Because we once regarded Jesus according to the flesh. And when we did, we crucified him. Right? We killed him. Why? Because we denied who he was. We we misunderstood him. In our flesh, we assumed that the suffering he experienced at our hands brought all his claims about being the son of God under question. We didn't know that God would look like this. That he'd be poor. That he'd be born in a manger. That he'd be humiliated. That he'd be tried as a criminal and executed. We didn't think God could be executed. All of that felt like condemnation. It didn't feel like exaltation. But we were regarding him according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. And I worry that's how we view ourselves and the people around us. We see suffering as God's judgment or humiliation as evidence of actual insignificance. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. Think back to the story that we just talked, to, talked about, the cross, which according to the flesh looks like an utter failure. It looks like shame upon shame. It looks like humiliation. But that was actually God reconciling the world to himself. And now, here, we see that it was also God modeling for us what true reconciliation requires. It requires a cruciform life. It requires pain. It might even require being misunderstood because it did for Jesus. Friends, listen to this. We want peace, but we don't want reconciliation. We want peace, but we don't actually want to repair what's broken. We want others to do that for us. We long for restitution when we've been hurt or when we've been sinned against, but we don't want to give those things to other people. We don't want the humiliation of having to forgive, having to absorb the wrongs that others have committed against us. We don't want to, we don't want to break silence in a fight. Seeking reconciliation like Jesus did rarely feels like the prudent, healthy option, either for our emotions or for our egos. It always inevitably requires us to stave off our longings for compensation, right, for our day in court when we get all that sympathy and all the accolades that we deserve. And oftentimes requires us to stave off those things indefinitely because To forgive means to actually render that offense null and void. It means that we endure the wrongs of another person without even the assurance that those wrongs will ever come to light. Friends, that's the offense of the cross. Do you see it? This is ugly stuff. This is not fun. To show mercy is to upend the natural order of things. It's to prefer the reestablishment of relationship over and against everything that might feel just or right or necessary or good. That's what the ministry of reconciliation really is. So while we may want peace, we seldom want the cross that makes peace possible. We're like Peter who would rather cut off a man's ear than let the gospel require any suffering or humiliation at all. So what do we do instead? Well, we circumvent reconciliation in all the ways that we can think of, right? Sometimes we refuse it altogether. We indulge our resentment by assuring ourselves that we are in the right. We stew in it. We nurse a grudge. We cancel each other for the wrongs that they've committed. And ironically, there's something There's something kind of honest about that because sometimes our disdain for reconciliation forces us to be honest enough with ourselves to admit outright that we don't really want peace. We want vengeance. And other times we go halfway 
Maybe we want peace in some way, shape, or form, but it proves way too difficult and way too costly. So the effort kind of stalls. We, we settle for something less than. We settle for tolerance. We settle for a lack of conflict. Praise God that he has shown more endurance in his peacemaking than we have shown with our neighbors and our enemies. And still other times, and we do this a lot, I think, we choose to just rewrite history. We got hurt, or maybe we hurt someone, and because it's so painful or because addressing it ever again is fraught with so much risk and so much humiliation, we simply choose to believe that everything is okay. We do this all the time, I think, when we face potential conflict too, don't we? Instead of confronting a disagreement head on, we avoid ever communicating about it. Because if we can do that, then at least we can preserve a kind of superficial peace. We sweep it under the rug. We tell ourselves it's unsolvable and therefore cannot be allowed to matter anymore. And in all these ways, friends, we disgrace our calling as Christians. As people of the cross. Friends, I pray that a vision of peace that's dependent on God's work in Christ would wake us up to our calling as peacemakers. As God's ambassadors, we are meant to be a people who reconcile the way that Jesus did, who solve conflicts the hard way. And because we do, people who find real, deep, abiding peace, not a cheap peace, not a shortcut or something skin deep, but a peace that's hard fought and well earned. And if you're telling yourself right now, I cannot do that. God cannot possibly be requiring that of me. Well, then hear this last Advent theme as a charge, as a command. That because you are in Christ, you too can choose not to count trespasses. You have been freed through the work of God on the cross to release vengeance. Why? Because any possible wrong between you and any other person has been dealt with already in him. Full stop. There's nothing left over. There's nothing that needs to be relitigated. It has all been accounted for. And remember, God did this for us because he was God. And we can't. He was the only one who could settle every score. But just as it is with God, your forgiveness of sin, your disarming of conflict, that peace that we're called to make, that isn't just some psychological reality. That's not a contentment in the midst of the storm. No, it's the way that we apply within our own lives and our own conflicts and all the ways we've been harmed. It's the way that we apply the work of Christ that has already been done. That's where Advent takes us. That's where these themes have brought us for weeks. Not just through hope or faith or joy, but to this thorny, ugly conclusion that to prepare ourselves for Jesus is to become people who seek peace through reconciliation that looks like that, through the way of the cross. Would you pray with me? Father, these things are too big for us. They're too much for us to grasp in our own power. They're too much for us to fulfill. And so we need you. I pray as we lift these brave things up like, like the serpent on a pole in the middle of the wilderness. Lord, that we would look at it and know that it is true. That we would see a way to live. Not to live comfortably, but to survive. That this, this is what it takes to be your disciple. This is what it takes to be someone who follows you, Lord. I pray that you give us bravery and boldness that you give those things to us in abundance. Come because we have prepared for you to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.